So today we are at um, in the sunny state of Florida in Jacksonville. Um, and this uh, session is hosted by the Mayo Clinic colorectal department. Uh, so thank you very much for hosting this. This is our team. As always, very grateful for Dr. Galandiek's um, supervision. Next slide is our disclaimer. That's that it is what it is. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as I was talking earlier, I, I tried to find some dirt on Jacksonville and it's very hard. It looks like an incredibly appealing place to live. Um, one interesting fact that I found was that the now defunct Jack's Brewing Company uh, was the company that invented the long neck um, six pack of beer. So this was, um, this was uh, during the Second World War when steel was requisitioned to help with the war effort and selling beer in aluminum cans was too expensive. So I praised the Jacksonville ingenuity in that. Um, I'm going to hand over to um, Michelle de Leon who is a, um, uh, who was a co-fellow of mine. And um, during fellowship, I saw firsthand how Michelle was universally respected as a surgeon and adored as a, as a colleague. And so perhaps in the next couple of slides, you can describe the city and the, and the unit and the hospital place. Sure, sure. Um, so again, I'm, I'm new to Mayo Clinic. I've only been here for about uh, two, two and a half months. Um, but uh, in my short time here, it's been, it's been a great experience and a lot of great people to work with. Um, and again, before I start, I just wanted to thank Vlad and Dr. Blandiak and um, DCR for having Mayo Clinic Florida host this month's um, journal club. We're, we're very excited to, to be here today. Um, so just a couple of things about Mayo um, Clinic in Florida. This was the first site outside Rochester that was built in 1986. And this was made possible by the Davis family, which is pictured up in the top left. Um, they were a prominent family that owned the Winn-Dixie uh, grocery stores, and they had received some care from Mayo uh, Clinic in Rochester and wanted to be part of the expansion and so donated um, all the land that Mayo Clinic is now um, housed on. Um, since then, there's been substantial growth um, with regard to the, the campus and what we do. Um, Mayo is routinely ranked nationally in several subspecialties often ranked number one in um, the uh, number one hospital in Florida by the US News and World Report. Um, and we continue to grow and have really become a tertiary center for the Southeastern United States. We can go to the next slide. Um, so our division, we have four, um, four attendings, four staff. Um, Dr. Stocky is our division chair. He came to us from Cleveland Clinic in 2019 and since being here, he has really um, shown great leadership and grow and uh, created a lot of growth within the colorectal surgery division, um, especially with the approval of our ACG me accredited colorectal fellowship that will start um, in the 2022 application. Um, Dr. Colabasiano is an associate professor of surgery. He is also a chief of quality for the department of surgery and will be the program director for the upcoming fellowship. Uh, Dr. Murcia, uh, also an associate professor of surgery, was co-fellows with Dr. C. Um, he uh, spearheads our cancer um, efforts at the Mayo Clinic and is also vice chair of practice for the Department of Surgery. Um, our division is further supported by our three wonderful APPs who are not on this slide but um, have joined the journal club. Uh, that's Chrissy Smith, Darlin Fajardo, and Amanda Staten. And then we have uh, two general surgery residents who are rotating on colorectal surgery right now. Um, Dr. Salim and Dr. Cheng, who will be presenting the articles tonight. Um, Dr. Salim's a PGY4 going into plastics, and Dr. Cheng is one of our PGY1 residents. Thanks, Michelle. That, that's, um, that's amazing. That's a very, that's a lot of growth uh, in a short period of time. Now, our, um, our poll for this week is, um, uh, as everyone should see it now on their screen, I guess it's a question about uh, when you recommend an intervention to a patient uh, for hemorrhoidal symptoms, what do you feel is the most important factor? And I personally find that uh, my belief in, say, pain is, uh, or pain post-hemorrhoidectomy, seems to skew my recommendation a lot more than my appreciation of pain for other colorectal conditions, including, say, a proctocolectomy, doesn't seem to 
worry me as much as sometimes hemorrhoidal pain. Anyway, we'll see what people say. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is our first paper, uh, systematic uh, review. So systemic metronidazole may not reduce bro uh, post hemorrhoidectomy pain. Um, this is a meta-analysis um, which uh, is um, by uh, Dr. Wannis, uh, who's the first author of the paper. It's the, available on the DCR website and the Journal Club as are all the articles that we um, discuss. This paper will be kindly presented by both Dr. Chang and then critiqued by Dr. Kalibasiana. Uh, Dr. Chang, please um, start when you're ready. Okay, so uh, this was a meta-analysis done in 2017, and the aim was to evaluate the impact of oral metronidazole uh, by comparing postoperative pain score with the patients receiving either uh, placebo or usual care. And um, hemorrhoidectomy is the most effective treatment for symptomatic hemorrhoids but excision is associated with severe postoperative pain. There are multiple local and systemic analgesic strategies and metronidazole has been proposed as an adjunct treatment in the reduction of pain. It is relatively safe, but overuse may result in resistant bacteria. And there are also reports of serious neurotoxicity in rare cases. Uh, the primary outcome of this study was the pain severity during the first two postoperative weeks, and the secondary outcome was time to return to normal activities. Next slide, please. So the authors did a systematic literature search up to July 25, 2016. The inclusion criteria was uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, adult patients undergoing open or closed surgical hemorrhoidectomy, active intervention of any dose of metronidazole for at least three days following the procedure, and control group receiving either placebo or usual care. Usual care consisted of a standard stool software and an analgesia protocol. And the other criteria was assessment of postoperative pain on at least three occasions during the first week. Uh, after doing the search, it, the study gathered five studies, uh, totaling 168 patients in the treatment group and 169 patients in the control groups. Next slide, please. So on the results, there was a statistically significant difference in reported pain scores favoring the use of metronidazole on postoperative day one and postoperative day four. Uh, this study also showed that metronidazole shortened time to return to normal activities. However, uh, when assessing for bias, they performed a sensitivity analysis and removed the largest study. And after that, the, they did not find any statistically significant difference between metronidazole or usual care. Next slide, please. On the conclusions, the improvement in pain severity on postoperative day one and four did not persist after the sensitivity analysis. And the authors concluded by saying the widespread use of oral metronidazole post hemorrhoidectomy may not be warranted. Next. Thank you very much for that. That's a great summary. Um, if I can get Dr. Kalibiasiano, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, to, to give your take on the paper. Perfect pronunciation, thank you. Um, I think that this study uh, was, was needed to be done. I think that I myself was wondering what metronidazole did, and I don't think I ever understood its mechanism of action very well. I think various theories have been put forth, but none of them convincing. And this this study, I was glad that it came out. There's another one 
by from Australia by Angelina de Rey, um, and that's an also a very good um, study, which much the same uh, suggestion that probably uh, metronidazole does not have a, a big impact in uh, on controlling postoperative pain. And there's other factors such as, for example, using the expiral or the method of hemorrhoidectomy um, and also the patient themselves that, that probably have a bigger impact than metronidazole. And so if there is a significant impact, uh, we just haven't been able to measure it. I would say that uh, the study itself did a very good job of uh, trying to match the different um, uh, articles as best they could. And uh, much like the Australian uh, study that I just mentioned, uh, it whittles down to five studies. And many of them, I would say that the four of the five that they have, um, the patients are in the order of 16 to 26 patients in each arm. And so it's really hard to come up with a, a very good um, recommendation after that. And so I would say that in my practice, I'm not really convinced that using uh, uh, metronidazole for purposes of pain prevention is something that I would pursue. Thank you for that. Um, so let's take it to the um, next slide, which is sort of the discussion and questions. Um, I'm going to sort of direct all the questions to Michelle and then she can decide who's best to answer it um, within, within, the, um, within her team. Um, now, my first question is um, one of the RCTs uh, described prescribing codeine as a post-operative analgesia. And I wonder how much of this pain associated with hemorrhoidectomy is due to constipation? And if um, you have a particular algorithm to combat this? Um, well, I can put uh, some input with regard to that. I think that, uh, you know, a lot of it is, you know, very patient dependent. A lot of patients that initially have issues with their hemorrhoids have constipation at baseline. Um, and then to add narcotics to that um, only compounds that. Um, you know, I generally for a formal hemorrhoidectomy will have all my patients um, stay on a fiber supplement and regardless of how their bowel movements are, just take Miralax daily so that, you know, it can kind of counteract um, anything with the narcotics or, or help treat the baseline constipation that they're having. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Stocky, how do you, how do you manage that postoperatively? I try to avoid narcotics and uh, um, I don't recommend any particular energy. Uh, uh, pretty liberal, apart from my um, preference not to use narcotics. So, so, for example, I wouldn't conceive using codeine, I, I think he's looking for trouble. Do you find that without narcotics, um, the, their pain is adequately controlled? I think sometimes it's a catch-22. So sometimes there is a situation that is so painful that they do require narcotics, but then they can develop constipation as a result of that. And perhaps uh, um, I do um, excisional hemorrhoidectomy. So I, I have moved away from hemorrhoidopexy and uh, I do not do... Um, a THD, which is the subject of the next article. And so perhaps these are uh, operations that will uh, would be associated with less pain. But I think that I've been pleased in general with the experience of patients who say that they have significant pain for one or two weeks and then things are better and the operations are generally durable and helpful to the patients who we operate on. Thanks. Um, one of the weaknesses, I guess, in, in, in reviewing these studies is that the technique is so variable from study to study and surgeon to surgeon. Um, now, in terms of the analgesia regimen uh, that, that sort of you offer, does it vary if you do a three column hemorrhoidectomy, less than three column, um, the, uh, the transanal dearterialization, or even just excising skin tags? Do you titrate per operation or is it just the same thing for all? 
Dr. Murcia, do you want to comment on that? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think definitely the extent of um, what we're resecting can definitely have uh, an impact. Um, the one thing I'd add that also probably leads into the, the answers that were given to the first question is that I think setting patient expectation is critical, uh, much like we've seen in, in the enhanced recovery literature for other operations, uh, you know, uh, educating patients preemptively of what we can expect for their pain, regardless of what we're doing on their anus and regardless of what we're going to prescribe them, uh, I think sets um, sets both us up for success in treating their pain effectively and, and them understanding what level of pain they should have. Uh, typically, I would, uh, I mean, every pump for me, uh, unless other uh, contraindications, 100% are getting acetaminophen uh, and uh, uh, ibuprofen uh, with, uh, I do prescribe narcotic, uh, but attempt to limit it. But I do think that if you're doing a three, uh, you know, a three column hemorrhoidectomy, that's going to be a, a vastly different pain profile than just excising a, a anal tag. Uh, and, and, and then I think the second part, personally, I tend to try and, and stay away from hemorrhoidectomy in general um, and, and try and manage their, uh, the functional disturbances that most of these patients uh, have and use hemorrhoidectomy really as a, a last resort in the, in the treatment algorithm. Thanks for that. One of the um, comments in the chat from Dr. Gottsman, he says, um, it would make no sense to attribute pain to constipation. Pain is immense. Uh, he attributes it to sphincter spasm, um, which I, I kind of think of as well. I give small doses of Valium for people, and I'm not sure if that small dose of Valium prevents the patients from calling me and complaining, or whether it's the, it actually helps with the sphincter spasm. But uh, from the panel, does anyone do anything like that? So I, for um, formal hemorrhoidectomy, especially if we're doing a three column, I have prescribed Valium. I, I feel that that does help uh, low dose with regard to the spasms. Um, and with regard to spasms, I will sometimes prescribe nifedipine cream to the area. And I have found that that, um, that can be also helpful for patients. Although some do, um, do experience some burning or stinging to the, to the area. Um, but I do think that spasm do, does have a significant impact on the pain that they're having. I would just uh, add that while it's true that constipation itself is not a source of pain, passing a large hard bowel movement will definitely exacerbate whatever pain there is there. So definitely um, that, that's still something to keep on the radar. Thank you. Um, I actually found it, uh, one of the studies in the RCT, I found interesting that they commented that they prescribed castor oil for two days prior to hemorrhoidectomy. Um, I've never done prehabilitation for hemorrhoid surgery, but maybe, um, maybe there is some merit to it. Maybe it is worth starting fiber a week before. I don't see any downside necessarily. And if anything, it might psychologically prepare patients for, you know, uh, for some of the challenges that to hit them. Actually, as I was reading through the, some of the references and their articles, actually that uh, prehabilitation, as you call it, it's, it was a little bit more common than I thought, so much so that I thought that maybe I'm doing something wrong, not using it. <laughs> but but it's, it was more common than I thought it would, it would have been. Thank you. Uh, my last question before we move on is a question about methodology of, um, of meta-analyses. So this is a meta-analysis of an RCT. Um, when would we um, sort of decide that the, the conclusion of the meta-analysis is, is conclusive? Because we do a lot of repeat meta-analyses and to me, some of them are very similar. Um, maybe Dr. Stocky, um, being being on the editorial board, you can sort of share your views on, on that. I am not an expert in the technique of meta-analysis. I think that uh, I've read the articles um, respecting and understanding the scientific basis of a meta-analysis, but it has to make sense clinically. So for example, as, as Elon properly pointed out, when, and, and as properly the authors of the uh, paper uh, uh, did, to re remove a large study 
then there's no difference in the two arms. So you need to have a sort of constant thing where results are being replicated by others. And um, the other issue in some of the new technology is conflict of interest. And so um, if somebody is in, in some ways interested in the success of a particular technique, I think that um, this might not provide um, the best um, and fair and fairest uh, assessment, uh, no matter what the technology, the the technique to do the comparison is. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions from or comments from the audience, we might move on to the next paper, please. Um, and so the next paper is called short term out um, yep short term outcomes of transanal hemorrhoidal detarization with mucopexy versus vessel sealing device hemorrhoidectomy uh, it is from a uh, i think from a spanish group uh, with dr trenti um, being the first author dr trenti um, i talked to um, we talked via email and i think um, he's holidaying with his family um, so unfortunately he wasn't able to present but um it was nice to always communicate with the authors regardless uh so uh dr salim uh if you could possibly uh summarize the paper for us absolutely so um this is a um paper that's a randomized controlled trial that's come out from the university of barcelona and it um, essentially states that the background is that um, open hemorrhoidectomies um, are considered the gold standard amongst surgical repairs. However, they carry significant um, post-operative pain and long-term symptomatic recurrence rate is not negligible. Um, and when compared to vessel sealing devices or THD um, in, in their own uh, randomized controlled trials, um, the vessel sealing devices uh, with hemorrhoidectomies do seem to reduce post-operative pain when compared to the classic opens, and they minimize um, and it's theorized that it is because they minimize collateral thermal spread and limit tissue charring. The distal Doppler guided um, transanal hemorrhoidal deauthorization associated with mucopexy, also known as THD, um, is also, when compared with open hemorrhoidectomies, associated with less post surgical pain, shorter hospital stay, and earlier return to normal life. Um, what these, uh, what the authors propose is a, a randomized controlled trial which compares VH, uh, VSH directly with um, THD, which hasn't been done before. Um, the, they, they theorize that the vessel sealing um, device or the hemorrhoidectomy involves an incision below the dentate line, and which is innervated by somatic sensation, and THD involves um, no incisions above the dentate line, um, which involves visceral, and therefore um, THD would have less uh, post-operative pain. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a multicentral trial um, with two arms, Paolo, and a one-to-one -one randomized controlled trial. Six hospitals participated in the trial, all within Spain, and this was done between December 2015 and December 2017. Their inclusion criteria was anyone, male or female, um, greater than the age of 17 and um, symptomatic grade three or four hemorrhoids. Exclusion criteria included anyone with mental or neurological disease um, that would limit the participation in their study, recurrent hemorrhoids, pre-existing fecal incontinence, anal sphincter lesions, previous um, anal rectal surgery, however, with the exception of rubber band um, ligated, sclerosis and thrombectomy for external hemorrhoids, um, concomitant anorectal um, disease, and anyone with an ASA classification of four or five, allergies to NSAIDs, um, acetaminophen um, or narcotics, coagulation disorders, and pregnancy and lactation. Their primary outcome that they were trying to measure was a mean post-operative um, um, days in which patients needed the NSAIDs to reduce the pain, and then they had um, several secondary outcomes, including intensity of pain, 30-day morbidity, use of laxatives, fecal continence status, 
patient satisfaction, hemorrhoid related symptoms and quality of life. On the right there, you can see um, the number of patients initially um, selected um, for eligibility, which included 186 patients. However, 106 patients were excluded um, for several release reasons stated. Um, a further 80 were selected for randomization. And in the left arm uh, were the THD patients, um, 39 of which were allocated to the THD arm. And all of them underwent um, the, the described procedure with follow-up and analysis. And on the right arm, you can see the VSH with 41 patients, and all of those patients also underwent the VSH um, with follow-up and analysis. Next slide, please. So um, the results of this paper. So on the left, you can see a, um, a diagram um, with post-operative um, um, pain on the, um, the x-axis and uh, sorry uh, y-axis and on the x-axis the percentage of patients and um, the VSH patients had an increased um, um, pain uh, post-operative um, percentage of patients taking pain meds um, in the second week which was um, significant. On the right you see two more um, diagrams and um, which demonstrate average pain and worse pain scores and they did not show any differences. Um, secondary um, outcomes are demonstrated in the table on the right, um, right lower side of the screen, um, which included the postoperative complications, um, including urinary retention, local infection, and rectal bleeding, which demonstrated no um, significance. Um, lactation, la sorry, um, laxative medication requirements, um, patient satisfactions, and um, um, time to return to work, um, hemorrhoid scores, and short-term form were all both similar in the THD arm and the VH. Please. So, in conclusion, um, the authors of this paper um, performed a re uh, randomized controlled trial, um, and THD and VSH are both um, safe um, and well tolerated for grade three and four hemorrhoids. Um, however, um, THD uh, did, was associated with shorter um, need for postoperative analgesia when compared with VSH. Next slide, please. Thanks very much for that presentation. Um, that, that's very well summarized. Um, Michelle, what were your sort of um, views on the paper and take, uh, take home messages? Um, so I thought this was a good paper. You know, we, I haven't seen any, and this seems to be the first study looking at THD versus using some kind of vessel sealing device. Um, there are several studies looking at THD versus excisional hemorrhoidectomy um, and post-operative pain and, and longer term recovery, but um, nothing with regard to using the vessel sealing device, which has been thought to decrease pain compared to excisional hemorrhoidectomy. Um, I thought it was, it was well done, it was randomized, it was powered appropriately. Um, and overall looking at, you know, trying to be objective by looking at the amount of pain medication required um, postoperatively, as opposed to just looking at uh, pain scores, which can um, often be very subjective. Um, you know, I don't think it, it comes as that much of a surprise given the nature of the procedures that the THD would be associated with the need for less um, pain medication postoperatively, um, just because THD is, stays above the dentate line, um, there are no incisions uh, from the bottom. Um, it was interesting to see that five, I believe five patients, um, they did a THD, but then they also excised external skin tags. Um, so I, I think that partly defeats the purpose of, of doing a THD if you're going to do some excision as well. Um, and in those patients, I think just a formal hemorrhoidectomy is probably, um, is probably warranted. Um, you know, I will say, although THD was associated with less need for the pain medication after, um, you know, when you're looking at return to work and return to normal activities, there didn't seem to be a difference. And I think that overall, when we're deciding on procedures for these patients, that has, uh, you know, in addition to pain control, that has a big impact on, um, you know, what we talk to patients about and kind of the overall economic um, impact a certain procedure can have. Um, so I think that overall, it, it gave us some good data to show that, you know, THD in the short term 
certainly um, may have uh, require less pain medication and, and thus be less painful procedure. Um, I think moving forward, it would be interesting to see what the cost analysis would be between the two procedures with regard to the equipment that's necessary. Um, and the fact that THD, although not statistically significant, um, did take a little bit longer than the VSH group. Um, and then also to see long-term outcomes with regard to you know, recurrence rates and um, reoperations that might be needed um, in the long term for, for these two procedures. Thank you. Um, yeah, all valid points. Um, we'll move on to the next slide, sort of the discussion of this paper or question. So if anyone's in the audience want, wants to say something, please please um, let us know. Um, now, I'd like to welcome Dr. Colorado, who's on the call, who's one of the Spanish translators of DCR, which is, um, which is a great new initiative. It so is somewhat coincidental that the paper we're discussing is from Spain, or um, it would be interesting if you have to translate that back into Spanish. But um, um, anyway, but uh, Dr. Colorado, do you, do you have any comments uh, either about your role or about this paper? I'm not sure if they are hearing us. Okay. Um, all right, well, we'll leave this um, for a little bit. Uh, I've got some questions prepared. Um, so, one of the things um, that I think is challenging is, you know, speaking the same language of what's a hemorrhoidectomy. So um, perhaps one of the panel members for uh, for the recording and for the more juniors um, that may be in the audience describe how do you actually do a hemorrhoidectomy, and particularly there is comments about another paper we featured this month talked about a minimally open hemorrhoidectomy, open closed. What do you do and why do you do it your way? I'm sorry, Vlad, is the, <laughs> is the question how we explain that or what we do or um, how we explain a hemorrhoidectomy to patients or? No, no, how, how you do it technically um, <laughs> and why you do what you do. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, Dr. Stocky, do you want to, um, talk about, uh, excisional, I know you generally do excisional hemorrhoidectomy. Do you want to, uh, explain your technique? Sure. How you do sure. it? I, I was trained by a, a surgeon called Santa Nibat Mungs, and, uh, I have largely modeled my technique on what he taught me. Um, so it's a sort of a variant of a close hemorrhoidectomy that could be maybe in the family of the Ferguson hemorrhoidectomy. So um, I, I use a Fansler retractor, which is a lighted retractor named after a surgeon of, from the University of Minnesota. And I think I couldn't live with that retractor. Uh, it would be much more to do the operation. And so the retractor is done in a way so that it's not a complete circle. And so the hemorrhoid that I intend to remove is is placed into the part of the retractor that is not actively retracting. So the, the, it, the part that rendered the circle incomplete. And then I use a pair of uh, uh, scissors that I'm particular about called Lily tonsils. Um, after I have decided what the size of my excision is going to be. And um, and then I remove uh, uh, the hemorrhoids using this uh, pair of scissors and I intentionally let the uh, pedicle bleed uh, because I want to see it stop bleeding as a result of my suture. And then I place a suture that basically reapproximate the edges of the mucosa that are resulting from the excision also taking with the bite the internal sphincter and that should close case scenario the pedicle. And then I reapproximate the mucosa all the way to the level of the skin. And, um, and I use two chromic to do that. And I repeat this three times if it's necessary and uh, if it's not necessary once or, or generally it's, it's rare that we do an operation, that I do an operation for a single hemorrhoidectomy and um, 
that is how I do it. And then I check the bleeding and I could add some figure of eight sutures to control the bleeding from the suture lines also using two acromics. Thank you. Um, now talking about the um, vessel sealing devices, do you think it has a role? Does it change the technique um, that, that you usually um, use? Um, Um, so I don't personally uh, use that technique. I've done it a little bit in training. Um, you know, I think that the idea is that there's less thermal spread and so that the pain should be less um, and that it can actually be faster because you're not having to worry as much about bleeding. Um, Dr. Murci or Dr. Colabastiano, do either of you guys use a, a ligature or anything for your hemorrhoidectomies or do you do um, uh, similar to what Dr. Stocky does? Yeah, do you use that? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Dorn. Go. I've used the ligature, uh, the small bite ligature, uh, with some success, and I found that it's uh, relatively quick. I haven't had um, to have to take anybody back to the OR for beating. Initially, as I start as I started as a faculty, I would also oversew um, the vessel, or at least where I thought the vessel was but I had stopped since and uh, haven't had any issues. I wish I could tell you that my patients have no pain though. <laughs> Do you find that they have less pain than when you were doing, uh, not using the vessel sealing device? I think so, but it's, uh, it's obviously, <laughs> uh, it's a very biased <laughs> uh, opinion, but probably, I would say probably. Yeah, I've used it sparingly, and, and I guess I would say the times I have, I, I don't notice any difference in their pain. Uh, so I guess, you know, a little bit of a different perspective, but I, I do I do it the same way that Dr. Stocky has described, and, and we both trained at the same place, so it's the exact same way, basically. Thanks. I find there are certain situations with, with hemorrhoidal disease, which I find more challenging than others. And this is where I start thinking about all these different things I could do because uh, my default is just an open hemorrhoidectomy, but it doesn't seem to do the job. One of the questions is, what do you do for circumferential hemorrhoids um, where there are no defined pedicles? And uh, I don't use a Fansler retraction, the retractor, but I would find it interesting if that kind of helps to define the pedicle more than, say, a Hill-Ferguson. Uh, but yeah, so what is the panel's view on circumferential disease? Um, well, oftentimes the circumferential disease I find is uh, at least the really bad ones are the ones that are coming in through the ER with uh, a lot of pain. Um, and I think that those can be the most challenging ones to deal with. Um, you know, obviously we're always worried about this with regard to the amount of you know, skin we're taking and, and preventing any kind of stricture and narrowing. Um, I will, you know, I, I generally just use a Hill Ferguson just because I've always, um, enjoy you know use that retractor and found that it works the best and in circumferential disease I will just try to identify the largest ones the ones that seem to be um, causing the most uh, significant problem excise those um, and then uh, you know if I'm worried about a skin in between um, may just kind of evacuate any clot or anything like that from other hemorrhoid pedicles um, until uh, they're able to um, recover from the acute period and then, you know, later on after they've recovered, reassess to see for the need for any further hemorrhoidectomy. I've, I've seen uh, a couple whitehead, whitehead hemorrhoidectomies in training and they just seem so traumatic to me that I, I never tried it in practice, but I've done before, if it's possible, if the volume of the hemorrhoids is so excessive, I try to do it in stages rather than try to tackle everything at once, if it's possible. That's interesting. What, what is your time interval? It depends on the pain, <laughs> but I would say, uh, I, I, would, I would wait at least a month and a half, I would say. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I certainly, I, I 
I don't know. Uh, I've been tempted to do intervals and I sort of stretch them out for longer and I always feel anxious about a delayed stricture. Um, and perhaps I just haven't done enough to be that confident and I don't know what enough actually means. Um, the other question that I have in terms of sort of complex scenarios is the referral you get from a hepatology department where there's a patient with bright bleeding and they say hemorrhoids and the patient's cirrhotic. Um, how do you approach that scenario? You don't. <laughs> you try not to. <laughs> I'd say that uh, treatment of their uh, liver disease and or at least a shunt if it's necessary, I would definitely stay away from obviously banding and um, you know, if, if they're uh, losing, I've had to do, to take them to the OR in an emergent setting, um, they were just bleeding too much and I just over sewed uh, rather than do a hemorrhoidectomy. I also like that the patient undergoes a tips and, uh, and then reassess the patient after tips is performed, I think is very risky to venture into a, an operation uh, without that. And I would not venture into an operation for hemorrhage uh, after some hepatologist tells me that the uh, portal pressure has um, been treated with uh, beta blockage. Um, I think that um, the other area that may be related to this is the call regarding terrible hemorrhoidal bleeding in patients who have cirrhosis and are in the ICU, which can be oftentimes a premortal uh, event. And so um, I think that um, we should not be easily drawn on into an operation because I've, I've witnessed, I, I, I've tried to be very prudent in these situations, but I've, I've seen colleagues that have operated on patients and they had to bring them back because of recurrent bleeding and the patient had terrible uh, multi-organ failure and um, and was diseased anyway in weeks. It was a very uh, difficult situation to deal with and it didn't give the patient any benefit. So I think that on all comers, these are also part of the cause um, that uh, a surgeon can receive. And so it has to be triaged appropriately. Thanks for that. Last sort of clinical scenario is a patient with a grade four sort of gangrenous hemorrhoid in the setting of having um, diarrhea for some sort of hematological malignancy therapy. I've had a couple who have been on chemo and their white cell count is low, yet they've got these ugly hemorrhoids with a black spot on the skin. Um, what would you do for those? Um, this is not a scenario where on all comers, there's a considerable proportion of patients that have a very poor prognosis from their operation. And so, they need to be, again, triaged appropriately. For example, discussing um, uh, discussing the, um, the pros and cons of an operation for a local problem in the context of somebody uh, who might have a poor prognosis anyway. I think that it's important to assess whether there is uh, just a discoloration or there's really massive necrosis of the, because somebody who is, uh, pancytopenic generally doesn't do well after surgery, so I would try to stay out of it. And um, I think Dr. Gottesman had written in the chat some um, uh, recommendations. But personally, um, when the patient has when the patient has grade four hemorrhoids, I try to reduce the hemorrhoid if possible, and sometimes it's impossible by applying a combination of lidocaine ointment and sugar, really sugar from the coffee. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, I manually, I could stay there like half an hour and I've manually tried to reduce and oftentimes this is successful, the hemorrhoids and it gets you over the hump, even in those cases, and I'm not referring to the hematologic malignancy patients, but those cases where an operation is warranted, but you can get to the operation in a better situation rather than having a, a significant edema 
uh, diffusely on uh, on grade four hemorrhoids and, and and put the patient to sleep in that condition. So I generally prefer to do that to deal with this uh, particular problem. If there, there's really diffuse necrosis, it's also possible that there's necrosis beyond that in a hematologic malignancy patient. So it might be a Fournier grown green rather than uh, uh, just uh, the tip of the hemorrhoid with a uh, purple discoloration. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you're that type of patient. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very, very interesting and useful point. Uh, if if there are no other comments from the um, from the chat bar, maybe we can move to the next slide, which is the result of the poll where Stephen Brenstetter shines. Hello. All right. So we do have uh, the results of the poll. I, I'll try to shine. I'm going to bring up the results. Now there was a pretty significant predominance for choice number one. Um, there were only 36 respondents, but we have many people chose the uh, definitive treatment of the presenting complaint, which um, you know, I think definitive treatment took my mind to a place that a lot of people are working toward a hemorrhoidectomy, but I, that's probably, I'm probably misinterpreting that. I found, I, I didn't get to answer, but I would have probably chosen three. I find pain is a very motivating, or you know, the phone calls I get because of patient pain are very motivating. Thank you. Um, one of the other studies that we, um, uh, we shared this month was um, from a team in Nebraska uh, talking about hemorrhoidal banding as a cost-effective analysis. And they observed that over 90% of patients were treated with four or less bands and that was successful. And I, I do, that made me think, you know, what is, first of all, what is the gold standard? What is the aim of the hemorrhoidal therapy? Is it really the open hemorrhoidectomy and excision or is it the, you know, uh, preventing of bleeding and also you know in terms of the tolerance of repeated treatment seem to be different in hemorrhoidal disease compared to pretty much anything else I offer surgery for. Um, now does the panel have a uh, anyone in the panel has a view in terms of um, how you sell this procedure to or the therapy of hemorrhoids to patients what do you think is the most important uh, for both yourself and for the patient? I would say, I mean, to me, um, uh, such a, a significant majority of these patients have an underlying functional disturbance that's leading to their hemorrhoids, uh, constipation that's untreated. And so many of them, I, I um, attempt to treat their, their functional issues and their constipation first before any sort of interventional procedure, because I also think that'll impact their long-term outcomes, risk of recurrence, and, and also their, their short-term outcomes immediately after any procedure. Uh, and so I think, I think that's one element and, and, uh, and then approaching it in a stepwise approach. And, and again, my, my bias is, is uh, reserving uh, excisional hemorrhoidectomy as the, the last possible resort, unless obviously I'm, I'm seeing the patient first time they've got grade four uh, hemorrhoids at, at this time that, that clearly you know banding or repeated banding is not going to be sufficient. Thank you. Extrapolating this further, if we're talking about patients that represent to you, um, so, and the scenarios are the patients had banding and they represent, or the patients had an open hemorrhoidectomy and they represent, or the patient had a um, uh, ligation and they represent. Do you repeat the same procedure? Do you, do you escalate therapy? Uh, what do you do? Um, Mary, Mary uh, Vlad, may I say something just to contribute to the discussion uh, about selling the procedure? I uh, this is a benign condition, and unlike uh, unless it's a grade four hemorrhage, the scenario that Amit was uh, suggesting. Um, I, so I want to present the options to the patient, but actually I view myself as more like the buyer than the seller of the operation. So. Um, I, I, I may have some ideas about risk of recurrence, et cetera, but patients, especially, patients tend to come, tend to come to the office visit with very oftentimes very definitive opinions about what they want and what they do not want. And uh, um, 
I I am available to I I do not encourage an operation if an operation is not necessary. And then um, if a patient is averse to surgery, averse to surgery and wants to try banding, um, I I can do banding. And uh, if a patient has large hemorrhoids, um, let's say grade three, and there are three files, perhaps I will be uh, vocal in saying this might not work, but if the patient wants a banding, I, I tend to um, oblige, uh, which I wouldn't do for uh, other conditions. Thank you. Um, th that, that's very insightful. How about um, say a patient's had an open hemorrhoidectomy done elsewhere um, and they come back? Um, so they kind of probably understand the severity of, of what that means from a pain perspective. Do you offer it again? Do you, um, do you sort of uh, quite restrictive in terms of repeat surgery because surely the bulk of hemorrhoidal disease can't be that bad? What do you do then? I think a lot of that has to do with the, the specific symptoms that they're coming back with. Um, did the severity of their symptoms improve? And it's just a little bit of prolapse, a little bit of bleeding. Um, and then, you know, what you're exactly seeing on exam with regard to how much hemorrhoidal tissue is left. Um, and then probably most importantly, um, as uh, Dr. Murchia was talking about going back to their functional problem, you know, if they have very severe constipation, IBS, having very frequent bowel movements with diarrhea, um, and they had recurrence after their first operation, I'd be very um, hesitant to offer, uh, you know, another excisional hemorrhoidectomy in that situation where um, they are still having functional problems because, you know, the recurrence after that, you know, may, may be just as high. Thank you. Um, that, that's all very comprehensive. I've run out of questions. If no one else in the panel has anything or uh, in the audience, we can move on to the next part, which is our special guest segment. Um, if we can see the next slide. Um, so if, um, if you look up Luca Stocky on the internet, um, you initially actually get a, um, a description of a football player. Uh, who was a skilled goalkeeper, and particularly, um, I think that's no coincidence that Italy has won the um, the European Football Championships this year. That somehow Luca Stocchi was involved. Um, but more to the point of Doctor Luca Stocchi, um, his um, this is a very short description of his profile. Uh, he is a very successful academic. Uh, he is uh, part of the um, uh, DCR editorial board. Personally, I, um, I find that he is incredibly articulate in, his way, in the way he speaks, and I find that I'm a bit jealous of that. And, um, you know, I can only effectively speak two languages, and he can speak far more languages. And I, and I always enjoy his answers from a... Uh, from the words he chooses. I think they're very well thought through. Um, now, the questions that I have for Dr. Stocky is uh, related to um, clinical research. Um, and the first question is, um, what is the component of a successful clinical research department? I think... Uh... The culture of the department, the availability of money in the department, but most importantly, the individuals who want to do research. So it's one of the clinical research is one of those activities that cannot be imposed. And so I think that is it's very unsuccessful when anybody tries to impose this and and I think that different individuals, and this is not just about research, but different individuals have different orientations and what they want to accomplish and what they feel good at and what they feel accomplished in doing and fulfilled. And I think that um, it's, it's better to foster this natural, natural inclinations instead of trying to um, push a personal agenda. I think that that doesn't work. 
this would be the i think it's a big um it's a big question a big open-ended question i think that we are um traditionally very um pressured by financial demands and i think that in the course of the last few decades their reimbursements have been decreased and so there's more pressure to produce than i think there was 40 years ago and therefore there's less time to do research i think there's a much less decreased number of pay, of, of surgeons that are academic surgeons and for example have a lab which used to be a sort of expected academic surgeon career and i you know I, I i train at mayo clinic and i work at cleveland clinic so it's a slightly different environment but i think that academia has changed even in the more traditional academic centers in the united states and uh, that is a challenge for whoever wants to do clinical research and um i think that um, um when uh, a a center is doing well financially i think that's the possibility that that is the center that has the possibility of cultivating research and i think also when a when a center is doing better financially there is a possibility of changing the culture and instead of looking at the financial results year after year if not more often it's possible to see clinical research activity that can foster uh, the clinical practice. And so it's not antithetic, it's not competitive with clinical practice, but it's actually helping the clinical practice. Thank you. Um, now, does a, um, I guess it's clear that a large department, large research department would produce more research, but is it better quality research? Um, is, is there a correlation between the quality and the volume? No, uh, I think that you need to look at the specific circumstances. I think it's useful when you're you're working in a place where there is a culture, and so in the culture there's a sort of network, and it may not involve only the colorectal the colorectal surgeon. It has to be an environment where you're stimulated by your neighboring specialties. So. Um, for example, if you do cancer surgery, you do cancer of the rectum, you may be highly stimulated by radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, gastroenterologists. Uh, that can be very useful for your growth and, and your, your growth in terms of what you bring to the quality of the research that you do. Uh, so it, it, it has to be an environment. And so sometimes large institutions are better that way some other it, it depends on the culture if you have a divisive environment where people are unhappy that tends to create a situation that is not uh, prone to to a good uh, um a good environment to produce research and um, people tend to withdraw and to um, be in a sort of survival mode i think uh, uh um, to answer your question more directly there, the, I don't think there's any proof that the size of the institution helps. And um, I also want to see so, to say something about innovation. And I, I've been working at uh, at, at uh, uh, I've been I've been in, in my life I've been only in large institutions, and so I don't have a large experience, direct experience to comment. But I have to say that as grateful as I am for the 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 amount of learned and I've been able to do in, in, in large institutions. Large institutions are not prone to promote innovation. The, the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic and the Sloan Kettering in the world um, will remain at, at their perch for the foreseeable future. So they're not meant to do active, re, uh, active innovation. I think that has to be something that comes from individuals within the institution. If you are selling, if you're in the business of selling a, um, a, a, a smartphone, motivated to know everything that comes out, because your survival is six months long, otherwise you can become obsolete. This in large institution is less possible. So I think it's the, the task of large institution is also to understand the innovation that comes from smaller places, because 
oftentimes innovation comes from smaller places. Thank you. That, that, um, that's very interesting. Um, just changing um, or putting one of your other hats on being the editorial DCR hat. Um, a few years back, I was asked to review a, a manuscript as, as one of the reviewers for pouch complications. And the manuscript was pretty good, but it was from a, a if not American, it was not from a big country. And this is sort of me thinking about Australia and sort of working in smaller places. Um, now, what do you do with a manuscript like this? So the numbers are not that significant, but the... Uh, and, and say you look to a bigger American institution like the ones that you've mentioned, and they would have published similar things, but on a grander scale. Um, how, how do you compete with that? Is that something where you take your manuscript to a local a journal or, um, or do you have to be that much better in selecting the topics that you research about? Um, how think do you, you approach it from a small place? No, I think you need to see the individual circumstance. And uh, it's wrong to attribute quality to larger places because of larger volume. I mean, it can help when you have to make a study and make the numbers and avoid the type two errors and you have two arms. And, you know, as we saw in the study, in the second study, it was powered. I mean, they, you know, the numbers were adequate because, of, you know, based on the assumptions of the study, there was, uh, um, there was sufficient power. I think that uh, um, I, I think that um, oftentimes a smaller study can be confirmatory or uh, present a um, exactly yes. I, I, I'm just reading the the letter uh, uh, and group thinking is a very dangerous uh, group thinking is a very dangerous uh, problem because. We're kind of talking to ourselves and we are supporting ourselves to grow our each other's career in a way. We are not open to the outside and we do not see people that are in the trenches. Uh, so I think that the specifics of a smaller paper can be, uh, it could be from a place that is not one of the usual suspects and it could be confirmatory or it could present a new idea that perhaps doesn't have a, a great strength, but but it is um, it is an idea that perhaps is controversial and that has legs. Like let's see, for example, um, you know, not that Sao Paulo is a small is a small town, but but it's like uh, as far as uh, um, the the watch and wait, the the birth of watch and wait, and the interest around watch and wait, and uh, it comes from one center in Brazil, which is not a usual suspect at that time, it is now, but um, then it creates a lot of controversies, um, a lot of um, assessment of the validity of the data, which is legit, but, um, and then this is picked up by others, it's picked up by Sloan Kettering, it's picked up by others, and now in the world, it's something that is done, it's done in the world, and there are individual differences and the indication, the approaches, etc. But this was a thing that came from a place that was in, in, in this particular world uh, relatively small and has created a change that is sustained over time. And that is part of the cutting edge of the treatment of rectal cancer. So when you see a small paper, I, I, you need to judge the paper in its merits. Um, there, there's no hierarchy to respect. Thank you. Um, sort of looking at the mechanics of a paper and being involved in paper writing, what are your expectations of a first author in a paper that you are working on? I would say they need to work their tail off um, and know perfectly all the data. Um, they might not know how to present the data. They might not have sufficient experience to understand what is particularly important in the data and what is secondary in the data, but they need to know something about the data. They need to have um, almost photographic memory of the data to be presented. So, and, and they have to be awarded 
uh, and they should not collect the data that I as the senior author present as first author. And I should be happy to be the support author because it comes from my institution, it's work that we did, and it's obvious that I was the senior author, if I'm the senior author. And uh, if I'm the chair of the department, I'm, I'm happy that it, it happens in the department where I work. Um, so, I, I mean, that to me is a kind of contradiction that I have never fully understood. But I think that the first author should be um, honored and should be, if, if uh, the finances allowed, should be um, promoted in presenting the data. Uh, so, for example, in our institution, I would uh, expect that uh, um, if uh, the abstract is accepted for presentation, we pay all the expenses for the person that is going to present. Um, and then um, ask um, if the author wants to do some more. Thank you. Now, just sort of going on that a little bit further, from a, uh, from a junior doctor's perspective, it's sometimes very difficult to identify, you know, who's a good senior author? Who do you, you know, um, sort of prepare to sacrifice multiple hours for? Um, so what do you think makes a good senior author and, and how do you guide that interplay with, uh, with the juniors to ensure that you get the maximum out of them, but also that they get the maximum out of you? I don't know. Maybe it's like being married, how you find the ideal spouse. It's just it works differently for each of us, I guess, for those of us who are married. Um, I think it's difficult to be prescriptive in this area. I think that people need to have integrity, honesty. I think it's very difficult if somebody doesn't have a record when they're more senior of, of publishing and being interested in research, it's very difficult to be convincing and say, we're gonna do this project. But it also, it also works the other way. If somebody says, I want to do a project and they never did the project, um, that that's a red flag. I think that, um, again, you need to, to people getting along and um, that there's extra time involved and uh, there need to be commitment on both sides. Um, thank you. Do, do you have, if you do have uh, people that are interested in research, doing research with you, and you don't have a good feel for them, do you give them trial projects? Do you kind of sort of try to get a feel of how good these people are? Do you give them a case report? Do you give them a you know systematic review or something where they can get the data without you know necessarily um, affecting the institution? I think that um, a part of our mission is to do research, I feel. And so if somebody asks for research, I think that, um, they have the right uh, to to be helped, and I think that um, it's generally better to 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 set up a sort of a timeline to understand if this uh, will have a future or not, and then things tend to declare. And I I haven't finished all the projects that I started myself, so I I cannot point finger if a resident or a junior author does not finish a project. That things happen, but I think that. It, th things tend to declare themselves. And I think that if, if, for example, as a senior author, somebody comes to me and says, I want to do a, I want to do a, a, a project and I give a project, I, I, I uh, again, this is just the way I do it. I, I don't give a, a sort of a, a trial project that has, the, that I have no interest in. I a project that I have interest in. And then you know, something can come out, the literature review, et cetera. So if the project is not completed, maybe the, the fellow leaves, the resident leaves, then I have some data that I will use with somebody else. And I would be honest and say, look, this is an incomplete project on a topic that is dear to me and could we do it? Uh, and so I, I, I try to be transparent. I, you know, I, I don't criticize if somebody decides to give a trial project, but I think it's very time consuming to, to create this subcategories, I mean, uh, life is short, so I, I tend to I tend to and utilize the 
few ideas that I have to uh, and, and put them to work. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so that concludes the questions that I have. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks very much to the team at um, Mayo Clinic in Florida uh, for hosting this. Um, the journal club session is recorded on the DCR YouTube channel uh, and it's always available. Um, and our last journal club for the year will be later this month um, uh, and that's hosted at the University of Michigan. Uh, so again, thanks, thanks everyone um, for tuning in. Thank you for having us.